This is Don Lunch. I'm Mary Kay Finley, Missouri Distinguished Professor of Computer Engineering at Missouri University of Science and Technology. And I'm also currently the chair of the IEEE Computational Intelligence Society History Committee. Uh, today is August 22nd, 2015. We're at the Sofitel Hotel in Shanghai, China, where we have just finished a conference on uh, Intelligent Internet at the Digital Masters Academy. And uh, I'm interviewing Kalyan Moideb. And so uh, please give your name and affiliation and contact information. Okay, thank you, Doran. Uh, my name is Kalyan Moideb. I am currently the Koenig Endowed Chair Professor at Michigan State University. I am in Electrical and Computer Engineering Department there. Okay. And tell us uh, about your educational background, the degrees that you've earned. Um, I graduated uh, from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, with Mechanical Engineering degree back in 1985. And then I worked a couple of years in an industry called Engineers India uh, in Delhi. Um, then I decided to uh, go for higher studies and I moved to University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa for my master's back in 87. And after finishing my uh, master's in 89, I directly joined for, for the PhD program uh, at the same university and I graduated uh, with my doctorate degree in 1991. Uh, Professor David Goldberg was my supervisor. Oh, wonderful! One of my one of my doctoral students is on their faculty now, Shukui Lee. Oh yes, yeah. yes. Good. So, um, so what was your first job in engineering and science? You mentioned that you worked in India for a while. Yes. So I worked with Engineers India Limited after my bachelor's degree. This was a company which was doing design of pressure vessels. Um, so I was uh, quite interested in working in a design firm because that was my interest uh, from my undergraduate degree. And so I joined, I thoroughly enjoyed the very first year uh, because I was designing real things, uh, real vessels, uh, cylindrical, spherical of different types with internal pressure, external pressure. So it was a good satisfying job. But uh, after a year or so, I felt that this was the same kind of job coming back again and again to me with different dimensions, using the same formula. We were redesigning uh, vessels of different types. So I, I started to get a little bit bored, and I thought maybe I should do something else. And, and then my friends were here and there in uh, at various other new, uh, industries around Delhi, and I visited them trying to find out if there was a better job. But I realized, no, uh, uh, I probably need to have to go back to academics. And, and that's where I decided that I will go for uh, higher studies, and I moved to U.S. Uh, to University of Alabama. Great. Um, so uh, what was your first paper published? Um, so I started, so when I went to Alabama, um, I didn't know anything about genetic algorithms. So I was... Uh, and of in the very first semester, I had to take um, four courses, I think, and three courses were compulsory, so I was looking for the fourth one. That's where I was uh, going from professor to professor to find out what courses they were teaching. Then I came across Dave Goldberg when he was teaching his Introduction to Genetic Algorithms course. He gave me a very interesting uh, description of what the method is and what it can do, so I immediately got hooked up. And I opted for the class, and then um, within a month or two, I think I decided to work in this area with him. And then as a uh, class project, I did an application of genetic algorithms to a design problem. It was a welded beam design problem. So that got me a student paper, uh, applications of GA to a welded beam design problem, thing which I presented in 1988. Uh, in California. So that was my first conference paper that was published. What you, conference? Uh, that was an AIAA conference on structures. It's an annual conference of, their, uh, of the AIAA. So, but that conference had a, so I could submit it to a special issue of, of AIAA journal. 
So eventually that paper got published in that journal, but it took me uh, almost a year to get it published because back then no engineering journal knew about genetic algorithms or even anything close to it. So they were very skeptical about what these methods are. They thought it was a uh, kind of child's play that we were mimicking nature. There was not much theory. So uh, the editor-in-chief uh, forced me to do a lot of things before he was convinced that there were some good ideas that you could publish. So that's the experience I had with my very first paper to be published in a journal. What a great way to get started. Yeah. yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, I, I remember that very much. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so this was also, of course, your first computational intelligence related paper. And did you say the title of the paper? Uh, I don't remember exactly, but it is Design of a Welded Beam Using Genetic Algorithms, something like that. Yeah. Great. But it, it was only authored by me. Uh, it has a good citation now because that paper has been cited. It was one of the early papers where GAs are used in any practical engineering problem. Mm -hmm. So it has been cited quite a bit now. Well, you have a very high citation rate in general. Uh, so yeah. It's uh, something over 79,000, something like that. Yeah, yeah about, about 72 or 3,000 now uh, Google okay. Scholar citations on all my publications, which is, uh, I've been thinking about how that's coming about. So I think right from the beginning after I took up the assistant professorship uh, after my PhD, I have tried to focus on areas where I thought we needed to do some work. Um, so one area was, for example, um, the real coded genetic algorithms. B uh, around early 90s, uh, we didn't have very good ways of handling real parameters. So it mm -hmm. was only binary coded GA. Not not many people use binary coded GS these days, but that was the only way you could apply a genetic algorithms to any problem. Uh, so I faced a lot of difficulties when I came back to India and started working with industries. So I go and talk about genetic algorithms to them, and as soon as I say that your variables needs to be coded in a binary string, uh, those engineers think these are computer science stuff, and they wouldn't pay attention to what I'm saying after that. So I, I, I could see immediately they switched off. And, and that motivated me to think that maybe we should come up with some direct way of handling continuous variables. So in 95, I came up with this simulated binary crossover, uh, which is uh, it is a theoretical development of a probability distribution that mm. mimics if I had coded that continuous variables in binary strings and did a binary one point or two point crossover, what could have been the, p the distribution of children that I would have created. So instead of going to the binary string, I now directly use that probability distribution. Mm, so there was a paper that was published in Complex Systems back in 95 uh, with my master's degree student. Um, so uh, that, that paper is also very well cited. And now if you look at many of the so commercial softwares that you have on GAs or even uh, research papers, they use by default this method called SPX, simulated binary crossover. And eventually I came up with another real parameter mutation operator called polynomial mutation operator. So this combination of SBX as a recombination and polynomial mutation as a mutation operator, uh, I see people just say in their papers these days we have used SBX and polynomial mutation. And and, and readers know what they're, what they're talking about. So, uh, so that was one one work that needed to be done. And, and then, of course, in talking to industries, I figured that uh, if there is a problem that is looked by more than one people from the industry, they always have different criteria. They think of different objectives of solving the same problem. That's the first time I realized uh, that most problems in practice are not single criteria based. They, are, they have okay. conflicting multiple criteria. And I looked at the literature, uh, there was a work by Dave Schaefer back in 84, mm -hmm. who did his thesis, but uh, the conclusion from his thesis was somewhat negative, that, that he could not capture uh, multiple points on the Pareto front. They all go to their individual uh, champion solutions. So uh, probably that's the reason why not many researchers have looked at uh, you know, multi-objective optimization through, uh, through evolutionary methods. So then uh, having that experience from industry, I thought we should relook at it and see what else can we do. 
then I realized Dave Goldberg um, in his book, 1989 book, uh, talked about a way to handle multi-objective problems using GA where it needed two things. One is the non-domination based uh, selection and the other was the niching operator to maintain diversity. So he just made a sketch, like two, three line sketch of, of what would be a good method, but he didn't simulate or nobody simulated till that point. So then with my first student, I thought, okay, let's have a look at that. And, and that immediately worked. And so that's oh, the method that's we called NSGA. Uh, so back in 95, so that was my first uh, kind of a real applica a real uh, theoretical paper suggesting an algorithm and shown on past problems that people that Dave Schaefer at least tried to solve that it was working a and just to tell you that um, a nice story that th so this paper was published in 95 and a year later I was in Rio de Janeiro for a, for a conference uh, and I saw Daryl Whitley, who was the editor-in-chief of Evolutionary Computation Journal, where my pa paper was published. Uh, he was coming on the other side from the corridor. So I've not seen Daryl for a long time. And because I left US in 92 end, and that's 96. So four, after four years, I'm seeing him coming from the other side. I still remember, first thing he did is handshake with me and said, that was a nice paper. Oh, so, great. so that told me that he could have asked me so many things. But, uh, so he remembered that paper was, was quite nice. So, uh, but after that, um, I have been, I was getting lots of emails about the details of that method. So I realized that people are interested in this area. So I've never looked back after that and, and worked more and more on that and fun, found that more and more things that can be done with it because there was nothing available. Uh, and the reason evolutionary algorithm worked so well in that is we were finding number of parity solutions in one run. Uh, if you had to use classical methods, uh, you have to find one parity solution at a time. So you have to run those methods again and again. So you, you lose the parallel searchability. Yeah. Wow. So. Wow. Wow. Fantastic. Well, um, so well, so your comments have already covered some of the uh, questions that I had about what persuaded you to study this area, and uh, and and so person or event would be David Goldberg, uh, uh, and uh, any uh, well, and I then mean the he's the most influential person for me to get into CI when I took his course and his motivations along the way. Um, I've learned how to do research through him, how to do quality research uh, by working with him. Uh, and I try to follow since then um, and never compromised on quality as much as possible uh, because I mean that's how a work sustains and that's how you get citations I think if mm. if the work is reproducible uh, and it's addressing the right problem at the right time so that uh, at, at a future point people would be interested in looking for such an algorithm so Fortunately, in working with industries, I could get those ideas very easily that the real parameter, the uh, multi-objective optimization, and then in 2000, I worked on this constraint handling method, which is a parameter-less approach um, uh, for handling constraints, and that's also a default method. So if I look at some of my top papers with citations, these, these papers come on the top, and then I was kind of looking back and seeing why they are cited so often, it's because they're very simple and no parameter and uh, they are needed in if you want to use evolutionary methods for solving optimization problems. Great. Um, so, uh, and, and you talked a little bit about the challenges that faced you, particularly with that first paper and people having skepticism because it was such a new field for engineers. Right. Uh, any other challenges that faced you in your pioneering research? Um, yes, I had some, uh, I went back and joined uh, uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, is one of the IITs, one of the best IITs at that point uh, in India. Um, but I figured that I was in mechanical engineering department, so genetic algorithm was not heard by the professors and the students of that, uh, that place. 
so obviously they were a bit skeptical about what do I do and 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 but they seemed they were saying I could publish and I could get some funding coming from industry government agencies but I did have some resistance uh, at one point my chair told me that we don't understand what you do so you have to find a niche which is more traditional and and start working in that so I was a little worried uh, at, at that point but with with the publications and the students that are coming to work with me they they forgot that after a while yeah so that that was something that I uh, that I thought could have been could have been on my way and could mm -hmm. have uh, you know forced me to to work in some other area but fortunately it didn't happen yeah that, that's often in one's career that people who happen to be senior to you but are actually less gifted <laughs> uh, tell you to stop doing something that you love to do and right. you should not listen to them. <laughs> that's, the, that's the background, you know, the background they come from and, and sometimes they think what they know and what, what the people have been doing, that's the norm. Mm -hmm. So if you come outside that norm and being a junior person, they, yeah. would, they would at least try to, to move you to their side. But my message to the young researchers would be, if you really like what you're doing, if you have passion to do that, don't listen to all that because don't you can find your stop thought. You. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I yeah, couldn't agree you. more. And then there's a nugget in your story for established researchers too because uh, your advisor had an idea as he was writing his book. He went ahead and put it in the book. Uh, it wasn't a completed idea, but it was a good right. idea. And and it turned out that it was a good thing that he put that in the book I, because you remembered it. I always give him credit because uh, that's another thing. I think y what we have to give credit to wherever right. wherever it's coming from. Mm -hmm. um, so he eventually worked on that idea with another of his students after after I left. So that's called NPGA, uh, Nish Perito GA with Jay Forn. Um, that method is still around, um, but none of them really continue working in in the area. So. It, kind of interest in his lab died down in that. He got interested more in messy GA and, and the building block kind of GA. Um, but uh, I being, having an engineering background, I was always interested in solving practical problems. So the multi-objective and constraint and real parameter, those were ingredients of any practical problems that you look at. So those are more interesting to me when I started doing research on my own. But but the yeah the whole emo the evolutionary multi-objective optimization as we call it now, it's a big field with a lot of people working with our own yeah. conferences, books, and journals. Uh, I think it all goes back to Dave Goldberg. His those three four line sketch that he had in his book, although it's a very sketch sketchy statement, but had the right ingredient. Uh, right. People have interpreted so it was good that that he had those very rough sketch because various researchers have interpreted his sketchy lines differently and they came up with quite different methods. Uh, if had he had spelled everything out there then probably there wouldn't have been any diversity and whoever had implemented it first would have been the, the only algorithm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you look back uh, I think uh, that was a boon in disguise. Very good. That's great. Um, so yeah, you, you've mentioned several uh, several very uh, fundamental contributions. Uh, maybe it's one of them, maybe it's something else. What, uh, what contribution in your career gives you the greatest satisfaction? Um, I think some of these work uh, in, in, in the evolu gener general evolutionary computing area, uh, like the constraint handling, real parameter, and there are a few other stuff that we did, or very large scale optimizations. But the most satisf satisfaction I had is from working on this multi-criteria optimization. Um, so I could see that a lot of ideas were just coming to me as we started to work on the first algorithm. So just to go a little bit further after that 95 work, uh, that one had a parameter to be tuned. That was the first generation algorithm had a parameter to be tuned. And uh, although we applied this to various problems, but it was always, you know, some uh, hard work to get that parameter working at the right place. And then I was thinking I need to remove it at some point. Then I think 2000 is when I had the PPSN paper on NSGA2. 
uh, where we managed to remove that parameter and eventually the paper was, the journal version was published in IEEE Transactions on Evolutionary Computation which has now more than 14,500 citations, just one uh -huh. paper. So um, probably one of the highest in, in the EC community. Uh, but, um, but that actually uh, made the whole EMO more visible to uh, people outside the EC community. Because if I look back these 14,000 citations, uh, more than 50% of them are coming from outside the evolutionary computing community. And they are mostly from applications like astronomy, applied physics, chemistry, uh, because in all these problems, there are multiple conflicting criteria. And when they look for some methodologies, they somehow come back to my website and see these algorithms. And, and another uh, thing that I found helped in getting this citation is that I kept a working code on my website. Ah, good. Uh, so that, that because That's it's a public advice. domain yeah. uh, algorithm, uh, people could download and, and use that for their research. Um, so NSGA2 had no parameter and you could solve two and three objective problems. Uh, but then I realized that if you try to use it for more than three objectives, there are certain issues with it. Uh, the non-domination becomes, makes almost the whole population non-dominated. So when you're checking the domination of the population. So that didn't, that slowed down the whole algorithm. So beyond three objectives, NSG2 wasn't very successful. But uh, there was a big jump going from one objective to even two objective and, and, and industry and people are happy that there was an algorithm that could do two and three, but I was under constant pressure to develop the next version, which would handle more than three objectives. We tried so many things because it's a very difficult problem when you're looking at a higher dimensional space and uh, automatically you want to start with a random set of points and go in that high dimensional space on the Pareto front and distribute itself in a nice manner. We tried various things, but eventually in 2013 and 14, I think 14 it got published, Again, on IEEE transactions, we have an SGA3, uh, which can handle up to 15 objectives, is what we have shown oh, in the paper. Great. So now we have ways to handle large, large number of objectives. Um, so that completes that, the, the dimensionality issue. But uh, in this field, I, I always try to lead in trying to come up with what are the main issues and how can we then come up with a methodology to solve it. So in multi-objective, you get a number of points which are Pareto optimal, and then you cannot just leave it there because you need to finally choose one preferred solution from it for implementation. Mm -hmm. And that's not just any arbitrary one you can choose. Uh, so there are preference information that you need from decision makers who will be the stakeholders of the problem. There are systematic ways you can ask questions because again, it's not very really easy to get uh, those preference information. You have to uh, ask the right question. You have to have an algorithmic way to look at it. Maybe maybe it's an iterative method that you have to start asking some questions. From there, you ask some more questions and how they answer those questions. Based on that, you have to answer ask some more questions. So, uh, and I realized that we don't do this in evolutionary computing, this kind of decision making. When I was looking around and I found there is a group called, called uh, multi-criteria decision making group. Uh, which is kind of started in 1970s. So I started to work with them to find out what methods they do. And, and I moved myself to Finland to work with those people for two years. Um, and, and staying there, uh, so these are mostly business uh, people. What school were they at? Uh, this was Helsinki School of Economics. Um, so uh, I uh, mixed with them, went to their conferences, read their books and found out those methodologies and then slowly got some of those ideas integrated with uh, evolutionary methods. So we could do both optimization and decision making either simultaneously or one after the other. So there are various methodologies that I've suggested over the years. So some of those work have shown directions for researchers to do similar things with uh, either with other methods or apply them to their multi-objective problems that they were doing. Then there are many other practicalities, like you have uncertainties in decision variables. Uh, no, so if you say the uh, this beam will have uh, 50 mm dia, you try to um, uh, fabricate it using any 
technology will never get exactly 50. It will get slightly off because of the tolerances that every machine will have. So now, because of that uh, uncertainty that you have in your dimension, if your objective function varies quite a bit or, or your solution gets invisible, uh, then what's the point finding that optima? Yeah. So then I embedded those uncertainty ideas into uh, evolutionary methods for finding robust and reliable solutions. Uh, later on, I realized that um, many problems in practice have by two levels. There's a hierarchy. They're also called as Stackelbar games. So there's an upper level problem and the solution for the upper level is feasible only if it is an optimum for another lower level optimization problem. Mm -hmm. So it's a nested optimization and these are very difficult problems. Many control system problems are like that. So uh, so people usually avoid this bi-level nature and try to uh, get the get both of these into one level and solve, but, but that's an approximate way of solving those problems. So I started to look into that since 2008. Um, uh, of how to solve those problems using evolutionary methods. So I've been always trying to look for niches for evolutionary methods where other methods will have difficulty. Uh, and I think that's where is our strength because we have a population concept. So anywhere population is helpful or you, uh, at the end you need a number of solutions, our methods are better. Or any kind of complexities that that would uh, not allow uh, a classical method to solve it directly. Again, evolutionary methods are very useful. So I always try to look for those things. Uh, also, I, I worked with uh, my colleagues in my, in my previous place uh, who work on um, mathematical optimization ideas. Because optimization problems have been solved for many, many years since Second World War, really in a systematic manner. We came much later uh, uh, with a different methodology to solve optimization problems. Um, so it's good for us to look at that uh, line of research and, and find out what they can do better and what they cannot do. So the ones that they do better, most likely they have a provable algorithm. Yeah. And there is no point for us to go there and say, okay, we're going to use GA to solve a linear programming problem, for example. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. So. Uh, so, but unless you know that path, uh, you would not know what other methods are available. Right. So, so, yeah. so it's important for, so if you're working in a field, it's important to know what are the other existing methods so you can appreciate your method and where they would be applicable. Yeah, you're reminding me of a couple of things that I tell my students. I tell them that dissatisfaction is your friend. So if there's something that you feel is a shortcoming, that you can attack it. Right. And then uh, I also tell them not invented here is outlawed in my lab. I want them to find the stuff the other methods. That's the way. Yeah. 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 Um, well, uh, so what do you think the impact that the Computational Intelligence Society uh, and its precursors have had on you? Um, I think I started much before the Computational Intelligence Society was formed, mm -hmm. uh, got into the GA kind of way of working, and uh, although many of my friends have left the field and did some other things, but I always believed in these methods that there are problems where this would be useful. So I, I was glad to see the CI was formed and, and neural nets and, uh, and fuzzy uh, logic systems came out to, uh, to solve related problems. So, these, so, that, so I was only working on evolutionary computing methods for optimizing problems, but then there are lots of problems where uh, the variables were fuzzy, uh, some robotics problem that I solved very early on. A and so once the CI a community formed and we could see these other methods that are also stochastic and can handle different kinds of variables or solve different Excuse kinds me. of problems. I'm so sorry to discover you because we are getting off the okay, better gather the of duty today. So okay. we must uh, gather the ready levels uh, so we must go. We okay. want some water. Water. You can you can sit here and oh, okay. meeting. But uh, we must go. We want oh. some water or drink. I think I'm fine. I'm, I'm fine okay. too. I'm fine too. Okay. Shishini. Okay. <laughs>
Yeah, Are you sure? I will not do. I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. No problem. Make one sheet. Section. Section. So you can cut, cut and. Or they can become okay. part of history. Well, part of history. history. <laughs> okay, why not? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think that that uh, uh, formation of CI with these three really helped uh, solve uh, practical problems. Uh, the neural nets uh, could, uh, were were you know improved their training process through evolutionary computing. Fuzzy systems were used to represent some of those uncertain variables nicely, and then evolutionary methods were used to optimize the fuzzy membership function. So all kinds of combinations uh, were suddenly possible to be done. Uh, so I was very happy to see that. But instead of diversifying into a generic CI researcher, I continued to stay doing optimization, but wherever I needed to use neural nets to model uh, my system or fuzzy logics to represent my variables, I did. But I never went out and really became a fuzzy logic researcher or a neural net researcher. Um, so uh, what about the other way around? What impact have you been able to have in, in the computational intelligence society? Um, so, uh, so you mean what kind of Roles impact have you had I made? Yeah. To play so or, or right. So, um, since I was there from the beginning, and NSGA, the my multi-objective work was noticed. Uh, I I knew the the players in this field, the main researchers in this field, and uh, they also knew what I was doing. So. It was. It became mutual, and then uh, I was into the committees right, right from the beginning for organizing conferences or giving tutorials, particularly in multi-objective uh, area. Uh, so uh, I, I was there right from the beginning. So and I could see that um, that if I stayed in the evolutionary multi-objective area, because that's where I was contributing more and more, and if I develop that, uh, so that way I will have the you know, greatest impact to the CI. Mm -hmm. And and fortunately, I have heard a lot of people saying uh, very soon after that, that uh, one of the reasons that the ECs are staying and, and getting more and more attention is because some of the multi, some of the, you know, problems like multi-objective optimization, we could do so nicely. So that kind of comment is where, you know, uh, giving me more confidence that maybe I should just continue in that. So I think it was mutual and uh, because of my involvement from the beginning, I, I knew who are these these people on the top and I was with them since the beginning. Good. Uh, and I'm glad that I could uh, contribute uh, to CI through my uh, uh, multi-objective uh, route. Well, that's the great thing about the society. Yeah. That's what a society is, bringing yeah. people together. So. Exactly. Um, uh, so, what impact has uh, our society made in engineering and science in general? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it did quite a bit, a as we see from the citations of some of our work. Um, it's remarkable the way evolutionary computing is being accepted, being used. I am now a uh, consultant of a couple of uh, industries. Uh, one of them is a software company uh, based in uh, Michigan. Uh, so, they, they have users group meetings. Um, every couple of years and I'm I was also in the users group meeting for other software companies. So I had the opportunity to, to attend those and see how the real industries like auto industries, chemical industries are using these commercial softwares in their day to day work. Uh, about three, four years ago they were all doing, they were using evolutionary methods but mostly single criteria problems. Last couple of meetings I'm seeing they're more mostly using more than two objectives, uh, two or more objectives problems. So uh, I think that made a big impact um, to, uh, to practical problems uh, simply because those problems are uh, difficult to solve by a convex optimization method, for example, or a gradient based method because they will have lots of optima. Uh, you cannot assume the problem to be convex, there will be nonlinear constraints. So so our method being flexible and having a global perspective, they fare well in those kind of problem solving. So I have no doubt in my mind that we'll see more and more applications of, of more and more acceptance of our work uh, in practice. Having said that, there are 
certain things that bothers me a little bit as well is that um, I see quite a bit of work. Uh, it's not one or two, but quite 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 a bit of work where, again, evolutionary methods are used for linear problem solving. Um, you know, th so sometimes uh, it doesn't make sense for working mm -hmm. on such ideas, or they are using an evolutionary method and ending up with a result showing, see, I use this method to solve this problem, and here are the results. Now, uh, as if asking the reader to figure out whether it's a good result, whether it's a bad result, <laughs> or uh, what is the contribution? Mm -hmm. Why is it that you have used that? Why, what kind of problem features that made evolutionary methods a good technique for that? I think uh, an author has that obligation to tell the reader, yeah. unless we say that we, we have not, you know, uh, there is no value being added. Um, so if you get few of these work is fine, but uh, I, I'm talking about some of the outsiders with whom I, I work quite a bit. So if they come and flip our proceedings and see some such papers, uh, they don't get a very good impression. So uh, we need to minimize some of those work and, and concentrate more on quality. That used to happen all the time with traveling salesman problem papers. Right? Yeah, I remember those days, yeah. yeah. Only a few cities and... Yeah, uh, and, and uh, just say, here's the tour without the tour. saying yeah. why it's good. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, that's been improving a little bit. Um, well, how do you envision the evolution of computational intelligence technologies? Um, so far, uh, things have happened in a, in a very regular manner. Uh, new ideas came out, which changed the, the landscape of research and evolution of the whole field. And then people went into it, a lot of ideas came in, like PSO, differential evolution for solving optimization problems. Uh, uh, so um, I think I'm quite happy the way this field has evolved. Now in the future, I hope uh, people will find more and more new problems where um, that our methodologies will have a niche. Mm -hmm. uh, because I don't think I don't think the classical derivative-based ways of solving these are changing too drastically. Mm -hmm. um, so we being flexible and not caring much about whether you are getting the optima exactly or not as long as we are close to it i think if as long as you keep that attitude uh and keep looking for more and more uh areas where we'll have a niche uh, the field will stay and we will we will we will be useful mm -hmm. but i think the greatest strength that we have is the ci is mm -hmm. is the is the combination of neural nets evolutionary computing and fuzzy mm -hmm. that are so complementary to each other yeah and, I'm glad that we have conferences that are happening often now every two years, where these three groups are meeting. So there's a lot of um, cross talks going around. Uh, I think I think it's uh, it's healthy in every way. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see though too many places evolutionary methods or even CI is taught as a course, as a regular course to even graduate students. Uh, at Michigan State, we have quite many courses in this because we have quite quite a few uh, faculty members working in uh, in, in CI area. Uh, but uh, even if there is someone alone working in 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 a, in a department, uh, I think the a formal uh, teaching of an evolutionary computation course, for example, or a CI course or an AI course, which has these three ingredients uh, in some depth of uh, their fundamentals. Uh, and the link between, you know, these three methods and uh, are absolutely needed, because no, we can so. ask students to read papers and learn, but uh, if it is their PhD topic that they are going to be building their career on it, I think they should have take a formal course where uh, they learn them uh, through uh, understanding the basics and. Uh, answering questions like why are we doing this, why not that, and maybe going through some kind of an exams uh, in the mm -hmm. process so that they're evaluated, not only just read papers and, and like a study course, but going through like other courses that they do. So there is a learning, and we have some books uh, in that uh, for, for that to be used, um, but I think collectively we need to pay attention to that a bit more so that every PhD student graduating in this field has done a fundamental course 
Yeah. Any books in particular that you recommend? Um, uh, there is not a single book that I I use for my course, uh, but I I usually used to use Dave Goldberg's 89 book, but that's so old now. There are lots of new ideas. Uh, so there are, for example, Zin's book, Ken Deong's book, a um, few other books. I've got a book on multi-objectives, so when I offer a full semester course on multi-objective, evolutionary multi-objective methods, I use that. Uh, I've got a big chapter on evolutionary computing to give ideas about uh, the fundamentals of these methods, the building blocks, uh, building block hypothesis and how they how they are known to work. Uh, so I think there are uh, enough books and materials to start that and maybe supplement it with some papers. Uh, but as I said, collectively maybe we should write one and, and then use more, more thinking more from a textbook point of view. Speaking of, uh, speaking of papers that can be used, you mentioned in particular a 2014 paper that you did that you... you yeah, could you could you tell us the title and when and where it appeared? Uh, this this was printed in uh, evolutionary computation uh, transaction evolution IEEE transactions in evolutionary computation. Um, I think it was the August 2014 issue. Uh, I, I think it says um, an evolutionary algorithm framework for many objective optimization. It's a two-part paper. The first part talks about the basic algorithm for unconstrained problems with uh, quite a few uh, examples taken from test test suits and some practical uh, example problems. The second part talks about how to handle constraints and uh, there is an adaptive version from the, uh, which was discussed in the first paper, so an adaptive version of that. Again, ended up with a lot of uh, uh, results on test problems and practical problems. Um, so those two uh, papers build the foundation of how these many objectives, so these when you have more than three objectives, we now call that not multi-objective but evolutionary many objective optimization just to be different from two and three objective algorithms. Um, so this gives the foundation and I think this is one of the, the, the ideas that we portrayed there is as one of the ways of solving these problems and I'm still looking for maybe some other ways of doing it. Um, so this was mainly done to beat the dimension uh, that these problems have when you go to four, five or ten objectives. So, so what we did there briefly was that uh, we um, uh, preset some directions in the objective space. We, we, we put them in a in a way so that they are well spread out and then all we, all we expect from the algorithm is to go down along these lines till it hits the parent of the So it's some kind of guidance that we have to provide as an additional uh, information to the algorithm for it to work. If you, if you leave it loose like it in NSGA2, you can't go more than three, three objectives. It's the dimension beats it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, do you predict any scientific or technological breakthrough involving computational intelligence? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> um, I think um, we, one of the things that bothers me a little bit is major applications which uh, we have not seen uh, through evolutionary methods. Now, some of these could be that they're already there, but because of whatever issues, the, the, they cannot talk about it. Um, but I'm talking about unsolved problems being solved by evolutionary methods. Uh, we, we allowed certain problems that were difficult to solve, like multi-objective, for example, traveling sense person or other things, a Boolean satisfiability problems, and uh, so we, we, we allow the way to use evolutionary methods to solve those, but again, we cannot guarantee uh, optimality. So for so from all practical purposes, I'm happy that we have we, we can at least do better than what other methods can do. Uh, but um, the breakthrough kind of work, which are unsolvable, 
and we have now found the evolutionary way to to solve it so which will often involve some kind of proof that um, I, I, can you do it every time or can you just do it once in a while and that kind of proof with our methodologies being stochastic population based is very difficult to achieve um, so I think that the, the breakthrough stuff that we can think of is something that was not possible even to be handled is now we allowed a way to to get to something useful uh, then we are making progress um, so, yeah. okay well do you have any final comments or thoughts or remarks um, yeah I think in general to um, to the young researchers that are just coming along trying to build up their career I would like to just point out that uh, don't shy away from handling the main questions that your field has at this point that you're starting your career at least list them down and see what you can do those because uh, you need you need publication in order to have promotions and, and with your students to continue so you need to do uh, the regular problems that you're solving but once in a while you should look into some of those toughest problems that people have been avoiding or uh, difficult to do or even looking for the niches uh, where your methodology you clearly show has a clear niche compared to other methods so that kind of uh, path breaking work that's that suddenly shows oh evolutionary methods can be used for this problem which we didn't know so uh, I think those will take us far but if we just only do the incremental kind of research that already some ideas there we just change the parameter or this parameter changed this operator changed with another operator yeah it can give you a paper but it should not be all what you do uh, and it's it's hard hard to do but uh, that's what's take you far and that's what's take the whole field far Good. well thank you very much Kelly Unloy. thank you Don for this opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Hey.